Sometimes you just need to take the slips out and bowl defensively. And you also need to be careful with your computer's defense as well. If you need a VPN, go Nord. NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber to get a two year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. So put in some dot balls and turn them into maidens via NordVPN.com forward slash Kimber. Welcome to the scoreboard morning, everyone. I am Jared Kimber, and uh, Travis Head is the greatest T20 batter in the world. No, sorry. Take that back. Obviously, it's Abhishek Sharma, the greatest T20 batter in the world. Apologies. It's probably going to be Aiden Markram anyway, isn't it? No, maybe Ishan Kishan or Tilak Lama. No, no, it's still Heinrich Klassen. So what does that mean? Is it possible that we found a wicket in Hyderabad where everyone was Heinrich Klassen? It's also worth noting that two bowlers didn't go for more than 10 runs and over here, and both are pretty good. But we kind of expect that from Jasper Bumrah, but Cummins is actually living up to the drastic overpay um, in the first couple of games. And what about Hardik Pandya? By the end of the season, there's a very big possibility he might be booed by two different fan bases, and one of them might be his own. This was just madness all the way through this game. I don't know how to explain it anyway. It was shocking violence against cricket balls. In fact, won't someone please think of the cricket balls? Um, but let us get on to the scoreboard part of the show. If you uh, want to ask a question, the best way, is, as always, is with the Super Chats. So please um, bang one of those through if you've got something to say. But we've got a little bit uh, to have a look at on the scoreboard part of the show to begin with. I mean, I don't know how we actually do analysis on this. I might as well just throw balls at you, but we'll give it a go. Um, so this is um, Sunrises Today versus RCB's 263 in 2013. So you can see that one, yeah, it's fairly Chris Gale heavy, wouldn't you say? I mean, Dilshan was there. Uh, Davili has played a little bit of a part, but I think you'd say fairly heavy uh, in one person's direction. I think that was the more interesting bit of today, right, was that, you know, we saw Head uh, going nuts early on and, and we all thought, oh, well, good on him. And then, you know, Abhishek came in and went a little bit faster. Markram started well, um, like I thought he might actually go faster again and then slow down. And Heinrich Klassen, this is going to sound weird. I actually thought this was a slow innings for him, considering everything. And I do wonder if it was a little bit harder to hit at the death, especially if you weren't set. Um, and th that, that will come into the Mumbai innings uh, probably more so. But, but yeah, I, I do wonder if that was the case because, you know, Heinrich Klaassen uh, really should have had a strike rate of 700. I know that's not feasibly possible, but on that particular pitch. There, there was a shot that Abhishek played. I'm trying to remember when it was. It was kind of in the middle of his inning, so well, it was before he made his 50, I think. And he got a kind of a length ball outside off stump, aimed at the top, uh, you know, aimed sort of angled in towards the stumps. There was absolutely nothing wrong with this ball. And his ability to kind of have so much time on this wicket to decide where he was going to hit it. And that they had a short third and a short and a backward point. And picking that gap is usually kind of it's difficult but also you, usually the ball obviously goes closer to one field or the other if you're not quite in control of it it goes um towards the other um uh, the finer fielder if you're trying to hit it too hard instead of guiding it quite often it can go to the backward point kind of fielder this is my memory of it and i haven't gone back and looked at it at, at again but it looked like he had a set square and he decided that the exact angle he was going to pick and that's where it was going to go and this is not for a ball that is that easy to play a shot like that from like the ball was it was full it wasn't short as i said it was angled in all these sorts of different things and you're watching it going that is there a shot that these players can't play um uh, if they're out there it was just absolutely extraordinary from that point of view uh let's start with travis head because it did actually start there uh this is his strike rate um, uh, down here versus uh, New Zealand in the T20Is. I mean, it had a strike rate of the first 10 balls of uh, 
166, which we all thought was fantastic. And then of course he's taken that up to 310. Uh, for the next 10 balls, he went up a little bit against New Zealand to 172. And then today he went up to 280. Um, and you can see if there's a weakness of Travis Head, it is in that 20 to 30 ball range. Of course, if he is going to score at this rate, it may not matter at all ever again. But but it, I, I thought it was really, really interesting watching him bat the, um, you know, the, the final form of Sunrisers. I still don't know what it's going to be. And we, we just did a big footmarks podcast about their batting lineup and, and how it has to work. And, you know, Pat Cummins not making it ideal by having to exist and, you know, Marco Janssen and Hasaranga and all these different things. And it's like, but if you just look at Markram, Head and um, uh, Klaassen, there's a lot there, right? Uh, but this was Abhishek um, Sharma. So this is his strike rate by bowling type in the IPL. So you could see, I guess right on pace, I would say that's maybe slightly under par overall, but but not terrible. Left arm pace, that's actually not too bad. I like anyone who who's slightly better against left arm pace than right arm pace. You can see he gets off spin, 147. That's way, you know, that that's high. I really like that amount. And left arm orthodox doesn't work for him. But wrist spin. And the interesting thing here is 147 against off break and 177 against wrist spin. It's very rare you see a pattern where those are the two strengths would usually be either these or it would be this and this because usually when people are good against spin they're either good against wrist spin or finger spin so wrist spin you know uh for, for some people because it is a little bit slower it goes up out of the hand allows them to use their feet better um, some people just pick the wrist spin better a lot of people like the finger spin um, and those sorts of things or the more common thing that is usually grouped together is that people like the ball spinning either into them or away from them generally into them but there are a couple of players who like it away from them but if you like off spin and uh, right arm wrist spin there's no that's just madness and it might not be from you know a lot of balls but um he's faced 50 balls of each there certainly worth noting anyway uh so this was him today so you can see here he only <laughs> only went at two runs a ball against Godzilla. um uh, uh, run a ball against pandia and we could see against uh, um, Mapaka, he went at, what's that, three runs of ball? Sorry, I could make that bigger. Yeah, three, three, <laughs> 333 strike rate. And this is him against Piers Chawla. And it did look ridiculous when he was facing Chawla, right? It, you know, we, we have questioned Chawla's place in this side um, of recent times. And uh, met probably many times, if you come, I think I did a podcast on it and did a video on it. But it, it, it's never looked more questioned than when he was bowling to Abhishek Sharma. And let's get on to the big guy here. So this is the highest strike break in the IPL since the start of 2023, minimum 250 balls. Heinrich Klaassen, it currently has a strike rate of 187. Now, this is the bit that I tell you, I think he can actually score quicker than this. If this team works the way that it is supposed to work, I think he is a two runs a ball player. And I, I'm trying to think back if we ever had Andre Russell two runs a ball season. Um, I, I thought he batted slightly, I mean, under par is wrong today, but under par for him, I suppose is the best way of putting it. Uh, and he still was absolutely incredible. It's worth noting Sky up here as well, 181. Um, and then and then you've got, you know, this sort of middle group with a bunch of guys scoring at 100, 150, 160. Uh, what, watching Klaassen today, as I said, I just felt like he left something out there. And I do think the ball maybe got a little bit soft. Um, but that's two incredible innings so far. And realistically, should have won both the games with, with his innings. Um, not, I mean, in this case, it obviously wasn't a one-off um uh, situation, but certainly put the Sunrisers in 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 the position to win two games. And we do know it got harder because of what happened with Hardik Pandya and Tim David, which we will talk about, of course. Uh, this is Heinrich Klaassen's strike rates by tournament since the start of 2023. So this is the SA20, 164, pretty poor. <laughs> this is IPL in 2023, 177. So that's that sort of Andre Russell mark, right? Uh, this is the MLC where he went at two runs a ball. Uh, the 100, interesting that he was a little bit slower in the 100, by the way. Worth noting. 
and also a little bit slower in South Africa. Don't know if those have anything to do with it. And so far, he's striking at 227 in the IPL. As I said, I, I think there's a there's chance the right way of putting it. I think there is certainly a non-zero possibility that Hunter Klaassen ends up with a strike rate of 200. But I do think, I think the things that usually stop you are, it's not always the player themselves. It can be sometimes some of the situations. He might come in at, you know, 50 for five, you know, situations where he needs to rebuild or a bowler might be doing something or a pitch might be doing something and all that sort of stuff. But if he keeps playing on, on flat pitches, I can certainly see that kind of a season for him. Uh, so that's Mr. Heinrich. And this is the Mumbai Indians top six batter strike rates today. So I've got a lot to say, say about this. Obviously, again, good to see Rohit with the intent. I'm not sure he had a choice today, but, but still. Uh, I thought Ishan Kishan, it, it's funny, last game people were already saying he was finished. Perfect start, really, to a game like this. Um, sadly for him, he didn't go on. Really, really happy that Naman Deer has uh, done well again. I, I like the way he, in both games, has looked really comfortable. Um, and uh, he just looks like a player to me. I don't know what his top end is, but I think he's got quite a high floor. Um, hasn't made enough runs yet that everyone's overhyping or anything, so it's a good time to buy your stock. But yeah, I, I like the way he's gone about his cricket so far. Uh, Tilak, this, I mean, on any other day, this is a fine innings. It just happened to be that so many other people have higher strike rates in his team and everyone else. Um, you know, he went at two runs a ball. This just was a day where two runs a ball was slightly negative. And then Tim David again. Again, probably uh, went around that, just under that two runs a ball, a similar kind of mark. And I'll come to him next, but let's start with Hardik Pandya. So my assumption is that Hardik Pandya is probably not seeing the ball as well as he normally would. Just just having a look at his swing and, and, and everything, the, the way his bat's going through, it just looks like to me that he's not seeing the ball perfectly. It could also show us that why he didn't come in earlier in that previous game. I know a lot of us have talked about whether it was Rashid Khan or you know bringing in other people. All those things are possible. But it's also possible that he knows his own batting and it's not just work it's not working as well as he want wanted to. But this is obviously in this game a hilariously low strike rate, right? Uh one thing I would say oh, one thing I would say about that is to go back to have I got Heinrich here? I don't have the Heinrich today, do I? So if we go back to Heinrich's um, strike rate today. I thought that Heinrich could have. Oh, I thought that Heinrich definitely could have scored way faster than than he did today. And and at the time, I just thought they were so far ahead. And sometimes when you're trying to hit sixes, you don't hit sixes, and all these things happen. Now looking back on it, I do wonder if it was slightly harder uh, to hit sixes when the when the ball got older, and. You know, if you're Heinrich Klassen and you are what? Let's have a look. So the strike rate. So Agarwal, I forget him because he didn't get any runs. Uh, Travis Head, strike rate of 258. Abhishek Sharma, strike rate 273. Aiden Markram, strike rate 150. And Heinrich Klassen, strike rate 235, right? I think it is possible that this is the sort of pitch where if Heinrich Klaassen had come in around the time when Travis Head and Abhishek Sharma did, he would have had a strike rate of well over 300. So that's why I'm saying it's under par for him. And Aiden Markram's another perfect example of a strike rate of 150, all things considered, doesn't look particularly well. But my question would be, was it just a little bit harder to hit those fours and sixes later on than it was early on? Uh, and if you look at uh, Mumbai's batting, you see that the guy, there's actually a bit of a decline from the two opening batters are up the top. Um, and then it just gets a little bit worse throughout the innings, right? And, and remember, Tim David was way behind on the ball count. Some of his strike rate comes from after the game was over. N not having a go at him, but just, just pointing out that that was also uh, what happened there. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that Hardik didn't have a bad game. <laughs> Because look at what this is. But it is worth, you have to factor that in. It's not like 
if he is slightly out of form and those cutters, it was the um, Unad cut over where he just kept bowling cutter after cutter where they couldn't get it away, where I, I thought to myself, oh, okay, that's, you know, bowling short and wide outside of stump, slow balls is not a thing that you would do on a normal wicket. But when they got to that point where they had the field set up the way that they did, and they realized that it was going to be very hard to swing that ball across the line from the leg side. Uh, it actually became quite a good tactic. Now, again, you still say Hardik had a bad day. That's a perfectly normal thing. And I think Tim David, both of them probably by their levels and having a look at everyone else. But I do think there was a bit of that. And if you go back and have a look at the progression, they were always Mumbai about 20, 25 runs behind where um, Sunrisers were. And if it did get harder later on, it means you're trying to hit even more sixes at that point and you end up swinging yourself off your feet, which is kind of what happened to Hardik when he went out. Anyway, uh, this is Hardik Pandya's strike rate versus pace in the IPL. I think this is also interesting just because some of these years are obviously his anchor years, right? And so it would slow down. But that ability to automatically... Uh, you know, to score, I mean, these years are almost once just over two runs of ball and the other one's practically two runs of ball. This is 140 and this is a strike rate of 180 and we've got 174 back then. We've got a dip year, which is 65, where probably, probably kept going out to pace would be my guess there. This is an interesting pattern, right? Because if they're going to bat him down the order, that's what he's going to have to start smacking again. Now, I'm not, that worried about this because some of this is going to be in a different role um you know i'm not worried about this one at all because this just this has just started but i am more interested in in this in general has he just changed the way he he, he thinks about it because i was watching him and i still thought he had that you know that sort of what would you call it those that sort of fast hand flat batting style that ability to hit the ball over backward point for six um or you know from sort of backward point all the way around to to uh, fine leg almost from the same ball, you know, that kind of power that he has and that, that kind of striking ability. But it is worth wondering whether sometimes when you change your role, you you start to change different parts of your game as well. Is, it, is that what's happening? I don't know. But this is, this is something worth remembering anyway. And we talked about Heinrich Klaas before, just worth, uh, I didn't mention this too much there, but you can see that uh, Tilak Verma um, in that same space. So since the start of the 2023 season uh, has a strike rate of 164. I thought this was a good innings from him. Again, it's, what I expected when I was watching this chase was probably 110 all out. The, what the Sunrisers did is just not normal batting. And there is even on a pitch, which is in your favor, there usually is an element of just the emotional torture. And, and we've seen games where that's not happened, of course. You know, incredible chases in Test Match Cricket. And uh, we saw the uh, South Africa-Australia um, uh, one-day game. There was, uh, there was a, I think in 20, uh, there was a T20 I saw like early on where there was incredible chase. And seen some Pro 40 games with big scores, with big chases and things like that. But more often what happens is the emotional weight gets you. And so, uh, you know, Ishan Kishan, Rohit Sharma got them off to a good start. But then when they left, you know, it really was Tilak Bama who, who got them back into that game. So I think they were around t t 10 to 1. Um, and when Tilak Bama was at the crease, he got them into about 240. So that's a big, big swing back in their favor. I, didn't, I wasn't watching the match predictors, but I'm assuming they were very similar as well tells you how good that innings was but ultimately it didn't quite work out for them and just worth looking at the two men at, who started it as i said before so in 2023 rohit sharma's strike rate was 130. i'm hoping he's going to get that up to close to 150 this year ishan kishan was 145. again 150 155 would be handy from him but if they're both going he probably doesn't even need to change that all that much Today, Rohit Sharma was 216 and Ishan Kishan was 261. It's just, they couldn't stay in. And, and you know, sometimes, you know, the, the pressure of having to score at that rate when you're chasing is very different 
uh, than when you're coming in against everyone else. And just on the uh, Sunrisers bowlers today, um, this is, I, I was so impressed with the way he bowled today. Now, maybe it just helped him have Pat Cummins out there, or maybe he worked out the wicket first. I, I don't know what it was, but, you know, you know, cut. This is like his figures on a normal pitch sometimes, right? To to have figures like this on a wicket like this, I know, again, it seems a bit silly to be highlighting that, but it, I thought it was a really, really good uh, bowling performance. Really sad about Umran Malik again. You know, was it one over they gave him? I can't remember, but it just didn't look right. Um, it just, that he should have gone for five wides in that as well. So he should have gone for more runs. I think it was a great work by Heinrich Klaassen behind. But this is quite interesting. We've seen him bowl well in two wickets. And so the last three games he's played in India, he's bowled very, very well. And there's a comment in, that, that I saw just before we started the live of someone saying something along the lines of, do we have to say he's one of the best, you know, um, uh, white ball bowlers in the world? It's three games. That's such a small sample size. And I think all three of, I think he was used perfectly in the, the game in the middle and he bowled fine. I thought he was spectacular at this, at this game, but he also bowled at the end and then bowled the strategy that was working for them. Uh, and obviously bowled brilliantly in the World Cup final. No one's got any issue with that. But he was bowling horrendously before that. Is it possible he's worked out that, and I've been saying this since, what, he made his test come back, that his best ball in Asia, um, uh, when, when the ball's, you know, um, not reverse swinging, is probably going to be his off cutter. Is it just going towards that now and, and doing that? Because I do feel that he did do that at times earlier in the World Cup and still got met. So I'm not quite ready to say um, uh, that he's back. But again, as I said in the intro, they paid him a ridiculous amount of money. They have upset their lineup. It's another stupid leadership decision. We can put all that aside for a moment and say that so far, he's played some good cricket for them, right? This is a magnificent spell to end up with these figures on a day like today. So very much well done to him. Um, and that's it for the scoreboard part of the show. So uh, let uh, thank you everyone uh, for listening to that. If you want to ask a super chat, you know how to do it. Well, I actually, I don't even know how to do it, but I'm hoping you know how to do it. Um, and ask one uh, there. I'll take a quick break and I'll go through the questions and I'll be back in a few moments uh, with those. But I am Jared Kimber and this is The Scoreboard. If you need your pitch changed, well, NordVPN can doctor any surface to a new location so that your IP address is set for you to win. Want to watch a game on a free stream in another hemisphere? Give NordVPN the ball. Or if you just want to watch a clip on social media that a cricket board won't allow, promote NordVPN to pinch hit. So if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber to get a two-year contract with a discount plus four extra months and gifts in some markets. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a bowler protects the boundaries in the death overs with nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber today. All right, got a bunch of comments here. If anyone else wants to ask a comment, the Super Chat is going to be the best way. Uh, where are we? Oh, I just realized I've got the screen laughingly small. So let me just, oh, I couldn't read my own stats. Etch says, did you see a glimpse of Old Booby? Fairly accurate Yorkers and a couple of balls over 140 uh, in the comeback spell. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that kind of all the bowlers look better at the end in that comeback period. Um, so I do think the wicket changed as I've, I've already mentioned. I do think that had a, that did play a part. And I think it probably played a part in the fact that Aiden Markram had a slowdown. Even with Klaassen, it had a slowdown. It's just that his slowdown still looks ridiculous. Um, so yeah, I do think there's, I do think there's, um, something to be said of, of that, but I did like the way the movie bowled because there've been other times I've watched him of re uh, recently where when he's come back on, he hasn't looked as, um, He hasn't, confidence is the wrong term. He hasn't looked as sure of himself of what he knows because his game, his body has changed and he's a different bowler now than what he used to. He used to be, I should say. And I do think there's, he's having, you have to work that out. So you have to go through, if you change, you lose a little bit of pace, or 
you know, you don't swing the ball as much as you used to, or your body hurts or whatever it may be, your physicality changes or your action changes, whatever that may be, you then have to find that new groove. And I think for Booby, we've seen him do it a couple of times in his career before. So I don't think there's any problem with that. Maybe a day like today when there's almost nothing to lose um, is almost a perfect situation for him. Um, but yes, I, I did like the way he bowled. Rahul says, does T20 cricket need anchors anymore? I, I mean, you could argue that it never needed anchors. <laughs> Just that the way that it was played um, had anchors. Uh, you need top level batters it, in order to face Jasper Boomer and Rashid Khan and I don't know. Gerald Kotsia on a tear or Sun on a rain or Varun Chakravarti on a spinning wicket or Tikshana with a new ball, whatever it may be, right? And so having a player with next level batting skills who maybe can't step out the way and, and smack it everywhere is still probably something that you can have. But what you really would like in the future is to combine those two skills, right? Which is the A.B. Villiers model, right? The ability to score at a strike rate of 160, but also when the, when the wicket is seeming around everywhere, can still bat. And, and that is really where anchors should have always been going. You know, you know Australia's going to um, the West Indies and, and America for the, the, that World Cup, right? They know there might be some wickets where an advanced batting skills might be required for, from them. But what they don't want is that anchor to be up the order in a way that kind of gets in the way of Mitch Marsh and Travis Head and whoever else they, you know, Cameron Green or even Tim David, whoever else they have in their side. And that has been the problem with anchors is that automatic right for an anchor to go out, even when there's, you're already ahead in the game. We're getting away from that. And I think that's a really, really important thing. But having a player with, you know, having Kane Williamson in a side for, a final or a work, you know, a World Cup game when Shaheen Afridi is swinging the ball massively is still going to be really um, important. But you also need Wayne Kane Williamson to not get you behind in the game, and that has been the issue. With, you know, KR Rahul and, and Virat Kohli and Kane Williamson and Steve Smith and a lot of these players, and it's it's that is is what sh can be trained out of that next generation of freakishly talented players. So Jaiswal and I say this with all hope they were, will hopefully not play that way. Whereas even Rishabh Pant was dragged back into that method. And you're like, no, you don't need to do that. That is not the best, that is not the most efficient way to use 120 balls. Sumik says, were they playing on solid concrete? Well, the balls certainly looked like they were. <laughs> there was, I can't remember who hit a six, the ball came back and there was just like nothing left of it, right? Um, there is a psychological effect of once batters get on top on a wicket like that as well. My, my guess is that wasn't like a 20% better batting wicket than another game where maybe a team scored 175 or 180, right? And it will look like that from a statistical point of view. But once you start to see people pumping the ball over and over again with that kind of confidence, and there isn't a ball that necessarily can slow them down or a type of bowling that can slow them down or even a bowler who can sli slow them down, you know, Bumra still went for some runs, right? Batters then all kind of the psychological impact of that comes in and everyone starts swinging and playing the same way. We have seen that before on other wickets. But as I said at the top, Sumek, if you have a look at that Abhishek um, Sharma shot, I think it was Abhishek Sharma anyway, where he's guiding the ball away. You just can't do that on a normal wicket. <laughs> Not saying you can't guide it away. You can't guide it away. Like it looked like he made the decision before the ball was bowled. And so sometimes wickets just do that and, and then everyone realizes it and everyone cashes in as much as, as much as possible. Uh, where are we? Vidang says, what is wrong with Luke Wood? I thought he would have done better in the opening spell. Uh, we didn't play in this game, did he? Am I going mad? Uh, so Luke Wood bowled one, one over in the first game where he probably should have bowled the first over. Interesting to see that uh, with uh, Maka, Ma, Mapaka, I'll get it right eventually. Uh, uh, interesting to see in that game that he uh, that he got the first over, which I thought was a much better move. Um, Luke Wood got one over, which he bowled okay, which was the second over, but maybe didn't swing the ball as much as they were hoping. And then they brought him back cold for a death over later on after one over. 
Hardik just got all of that wrong. We talked about it on a previous show. Here, uh, what you had is uh, um, uh, him not playing and them going for the 17-year-old. Not the game to make your debut, right? If, if you're 17. He went at 16 runs and over. Um, he got bowled more than Luke Wood did. So they've made another, they've made like another error there. This is what you would expect if a 17 year old was, was bowling in an IPL game on a flat pitch like this. I, I do want to say one thing. I love the way he looked throughout much of his spell because he did look like someone who was like, okay. In fact, before the first ball, and I suppose at this stage, we didn't know how flat the pitch was, but before the first ball, he looks so relaxed. And it reminds me of that scene in the movie Air where they're talking about Michael Jordan about to take the first shot, uh, to, to take the game winning shot. And I was looking at this kid going, oh my God, how is he this composed? That, um, and he's listening to his captain, but you can tell he's working through the gears and everything else. Um, but yeah, they might have to go back to Luke Wood, which is, is fine. Um, it's a lot of pressure on a very young player. Path says, uh, they got to come hard for Mumbai India's heartache. Tell us IPL exclusives, how other sports leagues handle this because this kind of thing could be abused. I have absolutely no idea what your question means there, Path. I'm really, really sorry. But tell us IPL and how other sports legals are handle this. I, I, I actually don't understand that sentence at all. I'm sorry, man. And number two says, why is home advantage back in the IPL with eight on the trot? Just dumb luck. I mean, teams generally win more at home than they do away as, as a general rule. Some of these games have come down to the wire. Some of them have come down to the toss. Um, I haven't seen any wickets that have been massively in, in favor of, of home sides, I don't think, so far off the top of my head. Um, sometimes things are just dumb luck. But sorry, yeah, I can't answer the first one. I, I just don't know what you mean there. Sorry. Path says, are we at the advent of a six-hitting revolution in T20 cricket where power hitting will be valued over any other skill in a batter? Kind of like the three-point revolution in NBA a decade ago. Um. I think we've been at that for a while. Like guys like Asif Ali, you know, in franchise cricket, no one was at Asif Ali is like a top tier batter and yet he was getting contracts. Chris Lynn got a hell of a lot of contracts um, despite the fact all he can do is hit pace um, on flat pitches. Um, Sun Onorain got a huge bonus in his. So no, I, I think it's been going on for ages. It's different. It's probably less like the three-pointer revolution I was going to say it's more like that. It, because the three-pointer revolution is about space. And it's about creating space so that you can't defend, so that you can actually score more at the basket. So there's a mathematical side to it, but it's also about changing the rest of the game. Whereas this is more like the baseball um, revolution where grounded balls weren't that important anymore. And the you know you want batters who can get the right kind of loft elevation and hit home runs. There's no point hitting the ball really hard in baseball and it going out to a fielder and you advance one base, right? Like for the same amount of power, you want to be able to launch that out of the park. So it's more like that from, from that um, uh, side of things. Um, what, uh, what else do I want to say about that from an analytical point of view? But yeah, teams have been looking at boundary percentage and six percentage for a long time. I wouldn't over index this game though. It's a bit like the anchor question. Like, if a game like this happens, all I'll get asked about is about is this. Well, we actually saw a drop in runs over the last couple of years, especially in the power play when they changed those balls, right? So, we, you know, we might see more wickets because of the bounces as well. We might see more sixes and more wickets because of the bounces. But I do think that T20 cricket and ODI cricket are going to much more towards bounces and um, boundaries than they have before. Uh, but... Yeah, I don't think this isn't... I mean, it's a bit like the three-pointer revolution. If you have a look, three-pointer revolution, other than one year when they bring, brought the three-point line in closer, has always it was always on its way up. And you notice it when it's at the top, but you haven't noticed all the other times that it was going. It's a bit like it's a bit like Adam Gilchrist. Adam Gilchrist changed it so that everyone went out for uh, and wanted specialist um, wicket keepers who could be batters. It's like, didn't Andy Flower and Alex Stewart play right before him? <laughs> right? So sometimes you remember the big explosive um, thing, but you forget it. So no, this has been happening for a long time. Women's cricket even is even more crazy the way it's going through. So we've been seeing that for a long time. But your ability to hit a six still comes down. It's a bit different than baseball, right? If you think about it from that point of view. 
and if you want to go back to the, the basketball thing, if you put it in this way, Andre Russell is like Steph Curry, all right? In that he plays a lot more shots that are low, um, for other, another player would be, be, wouldn't be six balls, right? Whereas Chris Gale was probably more like Reggie Miller. Uh, just that step before, and you needed the combination of, of Andre Russell watching Chris Gale to be able to understand what he could do. But Andre Russell has been playing now for a very long time. And how many players are like Andre Russell? And how many games have we seen in this tournament where someone like Daryl Brevis, who can hit sixes and fours all the time, couldn't hit the ball off the square? So it goes both ways. Uh, Naveen says, any thoughts on the CSK um, Titans game? Oh, my God. Uh, which I can't even remember which day it was. When people ask questions like this, there's so many games that we follow. Um, oh, wait. So... Oh, okay. So yeah, this is the one where CSK went um, uh, scored a lot. So I thought Ratchet Ravindra was amazing, and then Shim Dubey. I just did he hit his first ball for six? That's my memory of that. Um, uh, I thought that was really you know brilliant, and they just got too many runs. I thought once they put that amount of runs on the board, um, there wasn't much of a, a chance to come back. Um, I thought it was interesting that Desh Pandey, who everyone wanted to never see again, um, uh, actually had a really good game. Mustafiza taking wickets, I thought was something worth noting. Daryl Mitchell bowling was the one for me that I was just like, because I think I went out the room and I flicked my phone back on just to see what the score was. And Mitchell had taken a wicket. And I thought I'd gone into the twilight <laughs> I love Daryl Mitchell Bowley. Everyone will know the amount of times I've tweeted about Daryl Mitchell Bowley around the games, just because it doesn't happen all that often. So yeah, uh, I, but yeah, I just thought they were a bit too good. I'm trying to remember if there's anything else um, uh, that I thought was interesting. No, I think that was about it. Oh, here, here's one from my friend Rob Barron. So we do the um, Cricket 8 watch alongs uh, and he, there, um, he bets on wides in games, how many wides there's gonna be. And that game had a lot of wides. And just have a look at the bowlers in that particular game. You had Desh Pandey and Partharana. Um, and there was someone else. Uh, uh, was it Omazai that I was thinking of? That might have gone, that, you know. So when you have like a, that three guys who have a high propensity to bowl wides, um, might just be worth looking at um, um, overs on that. But yeah, that, those are the ones off the top of my head from, from that game. I just thought Chennai is better. Um, I'm a little bit, What's the best way of putting it? I'm not concerned. Um, yeah, I mean, just I'm I'm a little bit down on on Gujarat um, at the moment. Uh, I I probably if I was reevaluating them would have them slightly lower than where I did at the start of the tournament, and that's not so much you know on um, the points table because I'm obviously less worried about that than other people. Um, so I'm not worried that they've lost two games or, or uh, sorry, I'm not worried that they've lost one game, but just in that game, when they went up against the better side, I just thought to myself, they're not quite at this level that I thought they were at. Um, and they could have lost that first game as well. So they could be zero and two. And now we've had a look at Mumbai. The form, it just, I'm just not sure. Uh, Dr. Ayush says, hypothetically, if the BCCI decides to select its T20 World Cup squad, purely on basis of IPL performance. Can it work better than a conventional method? Well, that's how teams were always conventionally picked from domestic cricket. I think people have forgotten what a house selection works, right? Like, I mean, that is the conventional method of, of looking at uh, what you do domestically. There've been, if, if you know, there've been many players who've been in their international team and have gone back and struggled domestically and have lost out on spots. Not usually the great players. Um, I, I think that would be stupid to pick a side based purely on IPL form in the same way I, th I think it would be stupid to pick a uh, side based purely on international form. You know so much more, right? If you should be looking at what kind of squad can India put together. And I've done a whole, when they lost the last T20 World Cup, I did a whole thing about the sorts of players that they should be looking at, the sorts of roles and, and definition and everything else that they should be looking at. 
that's what they should be doing. They should be looking at how we can play T20 cricket in a way that we can win it. And then what are the best players to be able to go forward and do that? So looking at it from a um, IPL form or a last T20s form doesn't make any sense. You, you know, by this stage, you should know more or less what your, what, let's say 18 or 19 of, uh, of uh, um, players who have a chance of getting in the squad. And there'll be a couple of other flyers that, of course, you know, if a new mystery spinner turned up or you know, Abhishek Sharma keeps doing what he's doing or I'm trying to think of someone else. Um, Riyam Parag suddenly scores at a strike rate of 250 or something. You might have a flyer just because you've been waiting for those players to come good or they might compliment your side, or whatever that may be, or Shivam Dubey keeps going, you know, someone like that. But they will know who the best players are already um, from all the other IPL games and from all the time those players have been in their camps with them um, and from international games. That's how you pick sides from all that information. But yeah, domestic form has always been a big part of it. Um, but they're not going to play, they're also not going to play um, the World Cup in Asia. Right, so I have to factor that in. Be silly not to look at it from that point of view as well. Anyway, uh, that's it for the Wednesday scoreboard. We will be back on Friday for our next scoreboard. So we'll do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Wednesdays at this stage um, is probably the best way for us to go ahead. Uh, but I'm Jared Kimper, uh, and this is the scoreboard. Please like, subscribe, comment, do all those fancy things that the people like to do on the YouTube's. And we will be back again that time. And a big fan to a uh, big fan, a big shout out to all the um, uh, people in the in the super chat uh, in sorry in the comments. Huge shout out to people who gave us the super chats, but all the people in the comments for for coming in um, makes the show well it makes the show better because you guys ask really interesting questions, and then I go off on weird tangents that doesn't help anyone. And if that isn't what scoreboard is all about, I just don't know what is. Anyway, I'll see you again next time here on the scoreboard. If you watch this channel, you'll love us on Maine, where we do deep dives into the greatest cricket stories every week at Good Areas. How did Virat Kohli play that shot? What is so weird about Neil Wagner? And explaining the incredible misery of being a New Zealand opening batter. Visit our Good Areas site today. Want to show the world that you not only love cricket, but that you know the game deeply. Well, you need a Bodyline t-shirt. In fact, at Bodyline t-shirts, you can actually buy a t-shirt about Bodyline, but also tees inspired by the greatest players in our game. Head to Bodyline t-shirts today.